afternoon and welcome to The Full Scottish. Before I introduce my guests today, I'll, as usual, just run through the up-to-date coronavirus statistics. These are the this is the status as of 2 o'clock yesterday. 908 new confirmed cases of COVID-19, 49 newly reported deaths of people who've tested positive within the last 28 days. There were 1,449 people in hospital, 110 of whom were in intensive care. 1,173,445 people have received their first dose of COVID vaccination in Scotland, with a further 14,009 have received their second. Since the start of the pandemic, nearly a year ago, a total of 1,621,634 people in Scotland have been tested, and of these, 1,430,721 have been confirmed as negative, meaning 190,913 positive tests have been confirmed. And sadly, over that year, 6,711 patients who've tested positive have sadly died. Sobering figures, although obviously things are beginning to move in the right direction, but caution as ever is being uh, vaunted by politicians uh, north and south of the border. We have a bit of a science theme on today's programme, I'm delighted to say. We're joined, first of all, by Carol Monaghan, uh, SNPNP for Glasgow Northwest, who in her previous life was a scientist, or is a scientist, she was a physics teacher, and sits on Westminster's Select, Commi Commi Select Committee of Science and Technology. I haven't got my right teeth in this morning. Welcome, Carol. And we're also joined by Mirella Delebegovic, one of Scotland's leading scientists, um, currently Dean of Industrial Engagement in Research and Knowledge Exchange at the University of Edinburgh and previously Director of Aberdeen Cardiovascular and Diabetes Centre. Now, we've had some super women on the programme before, but today we actually have a real super Woman, Mirella, you were given an award, um, a Super Jena Award. Can you tell us about that, please? Yeah, uh, in 2018, um, in Bosnia, there was a organized um, first international festival of a modern woman. And at the end of the festival, they were discussing all sorts of topics, women in science, women in business, etc. But the end of the festival, after three or four days, I was awarded with a Super Jena um, Award, uh, which I was delighted about. And I have to say, I proudly display it in my office, and I'm actually based at the end of University of Aberdeen. Um, that's wonderful. And uh, I'm not going to ask you whether you wear your pants over your tights because that would be completely inappropriate. <laughs> but, but well done. Um, but the first thing on the agenda today is almost anti science. Yes, we're talking about Donald Trump again. And the not surprising but hugely disappointing news that the Senate have failed for a second time to convict Trump of um, his impeachment. We knew that we needed 17 Republican senators to break ranks with the GOP, and in the end, only seven did. Carol, as a parliamentarian, as a politician, this must send shivers down your spine, that sort of justice and the, and the moral leadership that we have a right to expect from politicians, no matter where they are, is sadly lacking in the States. What have you made of the whole thing? Oh, it's it's just been an almighty mess of a kind of few months. I remember back probably September, October time, there was talk about what the different scenarios were for um, for the American elections and what the outcomes could be and what might happen. And of course, one of them was that Trump would refuse to go or that there could be riots as a result of a Biden win. And of course, when we saw that coming into come into pass, I, I think 
most of us were glued to the television in absolute horror at what was going on. This is the, um, the leader in free speech and democracy, so-called, and, and here we have somebody um, inciting uh, followers in such a way. So it, it was, I mean, it's, it is hugely disappointing that it's, they've returned this um, verdict. I think being realistic, however, uh, I think that these Republicans were always going to put party before doing the right thing. And um, that's that's pretty worrying. I'll, eventually, as a politician, you have to dig down and say, the party is part of me, but it is not me. And actually, does my do my morals go further than that? And where, where will I draw the line? And I'm afraid in that case, um, they showed that they would party was always going to come top for them and that's I think is what's most disappointing about it. Thank you for raising that issue because of course you're right it's certainly in the UK you're not uh, you're not elected to represent a party you're elected to represent a constituency um, and the party political system has has kind of just developed over the years um, and the, the issue of moral leadership is clearly what's been shown to be lacking um, do you think if there was a similar, now obviously we don't have impeachment trials in the UK, but do you think if there was a similar issue of censoring a, a prime minister or a leader of a party in the, in the Westminster Parliament, do you think it would also split along the same partisan lines? Or do you think there is a sense of moral leadership and moral obligation that, that people might actually vote with conscience and with evidence? It's a really good question. Uh, it's interesting and probably the current Tory government and um, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister is, is probably a good good example of, of where we are. And um, we, have, we have Boris Johnson there with this massive majority. But I think what probably isn't always understood is the sort of makeup of those MPs. You have your old guard Tories, you have your kind of centre, uh, right of centre folks but you've got this new guard that have come in and they are just loyal completely loyal because they're thinking of their career first of all and they've also been elevated to a position that they weren't necessarily expecting and for some of them it's the easiest thing just keep voting the way you're supposed to vote and um, without actually having that that conscience to think Am I happy to rebel? Am I happy to vote again? So, so I think it's it's interesting. We have seen some of the sort of old guard Tories showing that they are willing to vote against party. I know we're talking about votes on particular legislation as opposed to impeachment, but we've shown that, that, that they actually do, regardless of what we might think of them personally or their politics, but at least they have some moral conscience there. Um, but others that will absolutely their loyalty and um, their ambition um, overtakes all else and they will vote in that way to make sure that they are well placed for the future. Mirella, I don't know if you've been following any of the trial, it's been quite compelling watching, but the videos that were shown, some of which hadn't been seen before, of what happened inside the Capitol, on the 6th of January have been really chilling. I mean, what we saw on the day was only a, a kind of sanitised version of what's come out since. Did you manage to catch any of it? Yeah, I mean, I think all of us have been watching this almost in disbelief. But I guess speaking to, you know, I lived in the, in the States for four years before I moved back to Scotland. I, a lot of my friends were kind of expecting this. Um, they were expecting violence immediately after the vote um, in November, and I think they were kind of feeling relieved that nothing had happened. So seeing what had happened in January was not really a surprise. It's just what is surprising is, is exactly what you just raised, how people are unwilling to stand against it. I think in UK we're a little bit different because we don't necessarily have the same kind of uh, party loyalties that they do in the States. When you speak to people in the States, they're either Demo Democrats or Republicans, and there's never that kind of middle ground, which is quite disappointing. Um, and of course, I wasn't shocked to see that, um, you know, only seven Republicans actually stood up and stood up for what's right. Uh, there was not there was not a surprise, but it is a disappointment, I have to say. 
I think the thing that the, the, the person who's most disappointing for me is Mitch McConnell, who's the minority leader of the Senate. Um, he voted not to convict and then immediately stood up afterwards and said it may not be over. This may go to civil legislation, civil litigation. The criminal justice system might be involved. He might not be able to hide from that. And he was damning about Trump's inev and clear indication that he was complicit, yet he voted to convict on the basis that Trump was now a private citizen. And yet Mitch McConnell was the person who made sure that the trial didn't happen until after the inauguration. So I've seen politicians sit on fences before, but that man must have splinters in his backside and um, he has to live with himself. And I think it's, it's utterly shocking. Interesting you were saying that, that, that you're either a Democrat or a Republican and that there's no middle ground. Um, there are two independent senators in the Senate who both voted to convict. I wonder if this is going to be what triggers a shift in American politics. A few American friends I have have been saying this might see the real beginning of the end of the GOP, that you might see a more centrist right party growing. But I don't know. I just... I don't think the American system has room for that. What do you think, Carol? Interesting, because when you were talking about uh, Mitch McConnell, one, one of the, the difficulties, I think, with impeaching Trump, and, um, and uh, by the way, I don't condone any of his behaviour in the lead up to the election or post-election, um, but one of the, the difficulties is by impeaching him, you, you do actually make a martyr for this kind of far right that has been unleashed by him. Um, so I think there was a difficulty there as well, and I'm trying to slightly play devil's advocate here, but um, if if he were impeached, it could have been it could have been the, a further catalyst to real violence in the States, and I, I think that was a danger. Um, it's it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few months and years because i don't think we've seen the last of trump and if he were to um raise his head again i'm not sure there would be much tolerance now within the republican party forum um but maybe that would open the door for a far right um a political party as we've seen in parts of europe as well so so i i, I do think it's worrying times a Pandora's box has been op opened by Trump, and it's really it's how we deal with that now, and and how Joe Biden really takes charge and actually um, brings back control. And he's got to reach out to these people, and that's going to be a massively difficult task to, it, it to undertake. It certainly is. Over seventy million people voted for Trump. Some of them were traditional Republicans who voted him because he was a Republican candidate, but a hard core of those people are the Make, Again, Make America Great Again campaign. And perhaps what's most worrying is Trump's reaction to this. Well, we could have expected it. It's been a witch hunt. No president has ever had so much done against him, you know, trumping it up. Um, but actually what he said last night was the Make, the Make America Great movement has only just begun and you know that seems to me to sound almost like more incitement to more trouble so we'll have to wait and see certainly none of some of us won't be cancelling our cnn subscription anytime soon to bring the news um closer to home uh this week saw the publication and reaction to the updated um investigation into sexual abuse in Scottish football. Initially commissioned in 2016 and reporting on an interim report in 2018 with 93 recommendations about how to keep our young people safe who are engaged in uh, Scottish football. The final report is absolutely damning. Of the 93 recommendations made, it's quite clear that a number of them have not yet been taken forward and there are still serious questions to ask about the safety of our young people. 49% of young people in Scotland participate in football. So the potential for real damage, unless we get this fixed, is quite concerning. Um, I don't want to go into 
too much detail specifically about the accusations. Um, but what is clear is that the Scottish Football Association and Scottish clubs have used as their defence that because the young people involved, 33 young people mentioned in the report, did not come forward at the time and report it for obvious reasons of being frightened, of being uncertain, people who are groomed very often don't, that they couldn't have known and almost trying to excuse them and say, well, we didn't know, so we couldn't do anything about it. Yet it's clear that a lot of people around the football clubs, including parents, did have real concerns. And perhaps more alarmingly, some of the individuals uh, who are only referred to by initials in the report, the perpetrators, having been disciplined by one club, were able to find employment in other clubs. So I want Mirella just to have a, a, a chat around this whole sort of this this whole kind of theory that if we weren't told about it, we couldn't be expected to have known because you can turn a blind eye and a blind ear to a lot of things. We've seen it happen. It's all come out in the Me Too movement around abuse against women. Is that a defence that we should be content with? I mean, we see this over and over again, as you say, Me Too movement being one of the examples, or most recently with the British gymnastics, um, you know, things being hidden and kind of just, let's not talk about it. I mean, I find this quite close to home because uh, my son started playing football from the age of seven. He's played with four different clubs now. I think the acknowledgement of what the report states and kind of taking those recommendations forward, first of all, apologizing to those who are affected is the first step forward to say we stand against this. We will not tolerate this. Yes, it, it was in the past. We acknowledge it. And this is what we are doing about it. I think kind of saying, oh, we didn't know about it. People hadn't come through is just not good enough excuse. Um, and in the past, perhaps, you know, you could get away with that, but not now. Um, so as a parent of a child who plays football, this, this is obviously really close to my heart. And I think we need to learn from this. And we do need to know who is responsible and what the clubs are now planning on kind of taking forward to safeguard our young um, children, really. Um, I mean, as you say, 41%, did you say, of, of kids play football. I think this is a major outlet to keep our young people healthy, out of trouble, really. Uh, so we need the clubs to, to kind of take ownership of what has happened and also show us the way forward. I think the fact that I think it's 49%, but it just underlines how important, for whatever right or wrong reason, football is in Scotland. And I wonder, if Carol, if that's part of the problem. So it isn't unique to football. We've seen the same allegations against um, certain elements of uh, religion. We've seen it against uh, care homes, foster homes, state-owned care across the UK. There's a, a theme here, isn't there? It's as if these things, um, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church, whether it's state-owned care homes, whether it's football, seem almost too big, too important to be subject to the same level of scrutiny that others are. Do you think that's been part of the problem? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the thing is, all of us have a vested interest in something that that has the potential to um, have abuse taking place. And the one thing, Maggie, I would say, and and something that bothers me slightly about all of this is we talk about this taking place in the past. We talk about events that happened maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. We talk about the um, abuse in the Catholic Church in care homes and, that have shut down or the people that have died or whatever else. I want to know where are the people now who actually are um, want to do harm to children because they've not disappeared. So I think as a society, we need to be really alert to the fact that this can happen and is happening and is happening now. So where is it happening now? And I've got to say, is that, firstly, as, as a teacher, um, 
often you would get kids coming up, uh, possibly at lunchtime or after school, looking for some help. And even as a teacher in that situation, you would have to make sure that everything was in place that made sure this was a safe environment. So, for example, you wouldn't close the, the, the classroom door and be alone in a class with a child. The door would be open. You would let other colleagues know that you were in there with a child. Now, that is that is very that's good practice, and this should just be the norm. And anyone who is not acting within these sort of basics of good practice, we need to be alert to and ask questions. Why is that not Why is that not happening? And you've said 49% of kids do football, but we've also got kids doing all sorts of different sports in all sorts of different environments. Where are the opportunities for people to gain access to children and what are we doing to make sure the children stay safe? So it you, should be a responsibility of all of us. So do you think current um, policies like Disclosure Scotland and, and CPD checks, do you think these are enough to protect children or does the system need even more tightening? I think these are these are a, a very important um, safeguard that is in place. So the, the, we've come a long way since what was happening in the past, but um, people can still have access to children, um, unfortunately, in different environments. And, and I do think probably uh, it's a difficult one because a lot of what we're talking, a lot of the the abuse that we know taking place of children is actually happening with people they know and it, it becomes very difficult. So I think there's just a, a responsibility in all of us to be alert to the signs of abuse, to be alert to what children are saying to us um, and ask questions. Don't be too afraid to ask questions if, 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 if you're questioning anything. Take it further. And, and as, a, as a teacher, a former teacher, Carol, you know it's often sometimes what kids are not saying. Teachers often say it's the quietest children at the back of the class that you have to be worried about because they're not yeah, speaking up. Absolutely. You're not always looking out for a, a child that's coming to you and saying, I've got, I've got something I want to talk to you about. Sometimes it's other things. Sometimes it's that they're withdrawn. Sometimes it's that they use language that maybe isn't appropriate for a child of that age, um, that could be overly sexualized or, or otherwise. And sometimes it is, as you say, it's just what we would call a, a child that's not thriving and you've got to ask questions. And it's incumbent on all of us to ask the questions about these children. Why are they not thriving? What is going on? And, and do we need to intervene in some way? It's quite clear from the over 15 or 16 um, uh, ways in which abuse was carried out and which the report has catalogued. I mean, I mean, it, it makes a paedophile directory of how to do it. I mean, it really is shocking. Everything from the use of alcohol to excessive physical training to um, uh, rewarding the young people with material goods, either as as hush money or, or a reward, um, that people, as you say, who want to commit abuse will find ways to do it. But Marella, one of the things that leapt out of the report to me and, and really made me sit up was um, some of the people from football clubs who were giving evidence and people around football clubs admitted that for some of the around some of the perpetrators although they didn't know specifically there was and i quote rumor innuendo and banter now how often have we as women seen abuse of women dismissed as banter and it speaks to the culture of football then and maybe now and the other thing that's also in the report is that the, the culture of homophobia also made it difficult for young boys and young men who'd been sexually abused to come forward. So how do we change that culture in what is predominantly a male-dominated sport, Morella? I mean, this is a you know million dollar question. It's not just in in football, but as I say, as a parent of a child who does play football, I I haven't seen this kind of behaviour, fortunately. And I think it is more about parental kind of involvement in the sport as well. Uh, and most of the people that um, kind of work with the young 
children now? Are there volunteers who have children themselves and get involved in the sport? And I think we need more of that. Um, I know all the parents are really busy because everybody does it on top of their job. Uh, but I think the only way forward is to kind of to speak to our young people. And um, you asked earlier whether the Disclosure Scotland is enough. Perhaps it isn't, but it's a really good start. Now every parent does have to have it, and every person who wants to take part has to have it. Um, you know, it's step by step. Um, and as you say, this the banter. It's it's we see this in in science. We see this in in everyday life. It's kind of dismissed banter about what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, or uh, being young is often dismissed as you've got an opinion that, that matters. Um, I think we have to take ownership to change things slowly. And as I say, the way I see it at the moment, uh, it's definitely improved. Uh, having read some of those recommendations, it was a chilling read, but um, now we know about it, we can actually do something about it. Well, the, the main recommendation has been that the football clubs uh, who were named and others who are not being named apologise for what has happened. I don't know how far that will go. Obviously, anything further on a on a, a kind of criminal uh, investigation is outside the remit of the report. But of course, many of the perpetrators are now dead because some of the abuse happened way back in the 70s. So maybe uh, an apology is a start, but I think you're right. The message is clear. We have to maintain vigilance in every sector that we can, that our young people are safe and that the concern of parents and friends and teachers and other people are perhaps taken more seriously. Moving on to something a little bit more positive, hopefully, about young people. Um, the 11th of February was the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Now, I confess, rather embarrassed to say I didn't know there was a UN International Day of that. Mirella, do these international days help or hinder the case of getting more women into science? Well, they're not going to hinder. I think it's a lovely initiative and it's really nice to kind of encourage young people into sciences and um, what we see at the moment is at undergraduate level there are more and more girls doing science although we do see a bit of a discrepancy whether they're doing medical sciences or kind of physics chemistry engineering maths where we still have underrepresentation of women so i think celebrating the achievements that women scientists have achieved is a really good and positive step forward However, I think we do need to acknowledge quite a few things. Um, getting women into science is a great thing, but retaining women in science and making sure they get to the top should be the top priority. Because while we do have, uh, you know, at undergraduate level, women doing sciences, we have more women doing PhDs, more girls than boys doing PhDs more girls and boys going into postdoctoral studies when we start getting to higher up positions within higher education industry it stops you know once why? women why does it stop kind of, and this is everybody keeps asking why is it why do we have attrition uh, perhaps there isn't as much support there for you know, women, the way we are biologically, we are the ones who have children. We are the ones who have to kind of, you know, take a maternity leave, even if it's a short one. We are the ones who deal with most of the kind of illnesses when the kids are not feeling well, etc. And there needs to be a little bit more support there. Um, and I think there is an acknowledgement for that, but it needs to be a little bit more proactive, getting women who get into science into more kind of leadership positions so that, you know, your students, your uh, peers can see how you do it. And I think the more positive examples we have, the more women we will retain. Well, you're a role model. Um, do you... Uh, do you feel that's part of your job? I mean, it's part of your job to encourage women into science? I see that. That is a massive part of my job. So I am the mentoring coordinator for the School of Medicine at the University of, of Aberdeen. And I, I, I do this all the time. We organize events to kind of share experiences. How did you get here? What barriers did you encounter? How did you overcome those barriers? But one bit that we still haven't kind of got through is the leadership. So 
you know, so often you will apply for positions. You will be seen as a leader. People respect you. You you show it with your research, with your publications, with involvement with other things. But when you run for a leadership position to run an institute, etc., quite often it will be the man that will still get it because they will have a few more papers than you and they will have a bigger grant than you. And we need to somehow break through that. So in some ways, women in science, women in STEM are kind of an epitome of the issues facing women across employment sectors and the, and the glass ceiling. And we know that people often uh, appoint people who look like themselves. So are appointment bodies very heavily male dominated? Marella. Oh, you're asking me. Well, I, I think there's now a definite push to have a good balance on appointment bodies. So you have to have both. But quite often, I think that could be an age thing as well. I was reading an article recently about why some women don't help other women. So you may have some women on the appointment bodies, but quite often they may be from the generations where it will be seen like, well, I had to work so hard for this. So, you know, I kind of stand for this. And I think there needs to be a little bit more camaraderie amongst women to help other women. It's a bit of a Madeleine Albright, you know, expression. There's a special place in help for women, don't help, don't help other women. But I think there is, there is some truth to that. We need to have a better support network and help each other out. So when you open that door, you keep the door open, you don't shut it behind yourself. Yeah. Carol, when you're a physicist to trade, when you were thinking back to when you were training and studying, uh, what was the gender split in your classes like? Oh, it was, it was absolutely shocking, but it, it, it hasn't changed an awful lot. I was one of three in my class, three um, females in my class. The class had about 30 males, so it was about um, one in 10 were female. It hasn't changed very much, and that's that's pretty poor. Um, it's, it's interesting. We, we talk about things like, for example, women into STEM, and Mirella's also already mentioned, we're actually quite good at some aspects of women into STEM. We're not bad at recruiting women, for example, into medical sciences, biological sciences, chemistry. We start having issues when we look at physics, engineering, and maths. And there are, there are big reasons why that is. And a lot of it is to do with societal views of what these subjects are. Um, and I think, I know um, Mirella's talked about some of the issues at the sort of academic side of it, but I think the issues are actually a lot earlier. And I've actually, while well, well, Mirella was talking, got up a, a PowerPoint that I once gave um, when I was, I was talking, a presentation I once gave about women into STEM. And I want to show you one of the slides from it. I don't know if I can hold it up to my camera. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, like cute as that is and it is cute and we can all say oh they're they're gorgeous and everything else that is the expectations that we put on on girls from uh, pretty much as soon as they're born that they've to be pretty that they've to sparkle that they're princesses that they're fairies and um, at no point in that do we say you're going to be a coder you're going to be a mathematician you're going to um design new sort of um houses that are going to be sustainable and and green um, we don't talk about that we we have a particular as a society a particular view on how women should behave and what we think is acceptable for them. And I'm sorry, it's in the year 2021, it's just not good enough. So does government have a role to play in this? Uh, the question for either of you, what could government do to make that different if, if essentially we're talking about gender stereotyping within the industry? And you're right, the figures for maths and statistics in particular are very low. 5% of women in those sectors in ICT, it's even lower. It's only 3%. So there's a massive amount of work to do, given that women are 51% of the population. So what could government do? Um, the, one thing they, the one thing they could do is start funding initiatives that are taking place and, and been serious about them. Could actually look at how recruitment takes place to ensure that it is um, recruitment on the gender doesn't play a part in recruitment. And there's some examples of really good practice going on out there however it would be better if it was actually this is what must take place during a recruitment process these are the the steps that you must follow 
I mean, I go to I go to companies as part of my job, and it's I find it laughable actually because they know my background, they know they know I'm a physicist by profession, and they make a point of bringing out the female physicist or engineer to meet me, and it is the female physicist, and the managing director or CEO knows them by name because they're wheeled out every time there's a question about women in science or women in, in engineering, they get the same person out. I'm sorry, the, the CEO shouldn't know the one female. There should be so many of them that actually it's, it's, it's just commonplace. So that's frustrating and amusing for me. Um, I'm using in a, a slightly um, <laughs> cynical way, but it, it's a, an indication of the sort of problem that is absolutely endemic in a lot of a lot of the big companies that we have operating. And I, I think the problems run deep as well in education. I remember talking to a group of young women engineers quite recently who talked about if they went out on a site job, they couldn't find safety equipment to fit them. The boots were all too big. They were made for men. They couldn't find boiler suits that they were their size. So they were wearing really quite unsafe um, boiler suits that were too big. They were having to roll up cuffs and and the uh, the ankles. There was too much material. They could get caught on things, and that's because nobody had thought that maybe they needed smaller boiler suits because women tend to be smaller than men and women. So even at that level, it's as if everything's stacked against women. And you know you're going to feel pretty disheartened. You can't go onto a site and wear something that keeps you safe because it's not the norm. So um, what could education be doing better, Mirella, especially at higher education? You're saying that women are taking up places. What could they be doing to make sure that transfers into the labour market? Well, I guess I wanted to kind of stress two things. If we want to really recruit people into those subjects where we are missing women, it's starting from elementary schools, from primary schools showing those role models. I've gone into my kids' schools, you know, for maths week, showing how I use maths in my science and how maths is actually fun and taking it forward. But I think for, you know, when you said about higher education and kind of the, the government, so many things are linked to funding. If you've got funding streams to kind of ensure those projects start, ensure that we have more women going into those uh, areas that we are lacking women this will allow it to happen everything is quite often linked to funding to be to be blunt about it i mean i remember um, when i first come back from the states and kind of started back um in scotland applying for the l'oreal fellowship you know um 15 000 euros um one woman from from europe and i'd asked one of my um, collaborators if he could if he would write me a letter of recommendation and he said no because I completely disagree that there would be a fellowship for women only why are men not allowed to uh, apply for it and you kind of think we are trying to readdress the balance you know what about and this the is boys what you're yes. often do we hear that what about the boys international day of women when's there an international men's day well do you know what guys it's the other 364 <laughs> Um, the, the, the theme of the International Day this year of Women in Science was to promote and highlight the role of women combating COVID-19, women at the forefront. So I want us to just um, turn the discussion towards uh, COVID at the moment and keeping to the, the science theme, is science beginning to win? Are politicians in the UK really beginning to listen? So. Uh, Boris Johnson is going to make a big thing tomorrow about 15 million people vaccinated. Uh, they've gone five points ahead in the polls. People are thinking, oh, now maybe the government have got it right. Um, but at the same time, scientists are undercutting that sense of crowing and saying, well, maybe 15 million vaccinated, there's 100,000 dead, and you didn't listen to us early enough. So, Mirella, do you think scientists are being taken seriously enough yet around COVID? I mean, I'm hoping we are being taken seriously. 
So um, I, I don't I don't know if you know about one of the early projects that came from the Scottish government for kind of combating the epidemic and developing new tools actually um, came to our lab. So my lab is leading on on a project developing an antibody test that would be reliable and sensitive, for example. And a lot of the people leading on those projects, majority within our university, were all women actually. But in regards to scientists, you know. <clears throat> We have been saying for a very long time that one of the major problems with the epidemic at the moment is, you know, we're, we're in a lockdown, yet we are letting people fly in constantly, internationally, without any kind of, um, you know, 10, 10 day um, uh, retreat sort of thing. So um, finally, we're being listened to, but it's a little bit late. It's a little bit disappointing that we've been in lockdown since 22nd of March last year, really, but only on 15th of February, as of tomorrow, we will be getting people to actually isolate for 10 days. Um, but I think what we have been able to show um, is how important science is and how important academic research is to kind of collaborate with industrial partners to bring us this vaccine. You know, I know so many people are very kind of skeptical. Oh, how could this happen so quickly? Because we are all working together. And if only we were allowed the funding and the opportunities to work together more often, perhaps we would be closer to other cures for other diseases, not just when the pandemic happens. Do you think that's something that might that might be a lesson that's learned from this then? I certainly hope so. I mean, you know, things that we're not talking about at the moment is the kind of uh, how many patients have now had cardiac arrest because they haven't been able to access hospitals. No research is being able to happen because we're all working at such small capacity. But, you know, we've got a growing epidemic of cancer pa um, cases, diabetes cases, heart, heart failure, and that is going to have to be dealt with ASAP. And actually, if we're to learn something is if we put in money and if we allow collaborations with the, between academia and industry, we will actually get there much faster. Yeah. Um do you think there's a thing, Carol, though, about the about the right and the far right and this attitude to being anti-science? So we saw it in America very strongly with Donald Trump um, suggesting we drank bleach and shone lights down our throats, um, but a real rejection of science. And there has been a fairly consistent message coming out of um, the Westminster government that somehow the politicians knew best. Do you think that's just inevitable with right-wing governments that somehow they don't want to pay attention to science? It's, it's, it's a really good question. And it, I've got to say, I, I, I think they are now paying some attention, but a lot of us very early on, and I think I, I raised it in Prime Minister's questions right at the start of March about what action, this was last year, what action we were taking and how we were we were approaching the, um, the pandemic. Um, so I think there's, there's a real, there's a real, I, I suppose awareness now amongst um, scientists, but I do, I do worry slightly if we look at the countries that had dealt well with the pandemic. Um, they shut down hard and they shut down quickly, and we were slow to do that. And also, if you look, and we were slow to do it, I think because of threats or concerns about the economy and the economic impact of a lockdown. But if we look at South Korea as a perfect example, New Zealand's another one. If we look at the, the economic bounce back from these countries, it's almost as though the pandemic didn't happen for them because they haven't had a major economic hit in the way that we are having. So it's, it's quite, I think at some point, e economics has taken over. Um, possibly we're winning the battle a bit now that science and health regards are taking are, are now starting to come more to the fore, which is which is good. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're right, the economics was more important. I think one thing that Nicola Sturgeon said many, many times whenever she was talking was we can rebuild the economy, we can't rebuild lives that are lost. And I'm not sure it was the same outlook in the from the Westminster government. I would agree with that definitely, and um, you know, Nicola Sturgeon has been accused, quite wrongly uh, and and clearly, 
um, not in the least has she used it as a political football. She's been quite um, conscious not to, even though we've done things slightly differently. But I think there's no doubt that the Westminster government have tried to politicise this all the way through, um, including Boris Johnson's recent visit to Scotland, which was against COVID um, travel rules. Um, the, the people behind the Oxford vaccine, though, have also come out and said that they seem surprised that the government is now saying that COVID is transferring as an airborne virus in quarantine hotels, because they've been saying from the beginning that it's transferred as airborne. And that message still doesn't seem to get across. So I don't know how we're going to persuade the government to pay attention to this. Something like 75 or 65 or 75 backbench Tory MPs have formed a group that are now demanding that um, by Easter all COVID restrictions are removed because the most vulnerable would have been vaccinated and we need to get back to normal. Now, we've no idea how uh, Boris Johnson is going to respond to that. He chops and changes between saying we'll get things back to normal quickly to we can't be too careful. Um, I'm wondering, Carol, I know you're not all in Westminster at the moment, but I'm wondering if you've got any sense of just how many MPs are pushing the government to really come out of lockdown too quickly. Oh, I think there's great pressure, absolutely. And you've got to remember, of course, that this is this is a a, a virus that is um, that attacks the poor, <laughs> because poor the, the disadvantaged are more likely to be in a situation that puts them at risk. I'm able to sit here in the comfort of my home and work and work safely, and I don't need to put myself into a situation that puts me at risk. I understand that I'm very privileged in that. Not everybody is is, is in, ha, has such a privileged situation. And if you're a if you're a Tory MP living in the shires where the cases are low and where people are affluent, um, of course you're more interested in restarting the economy than you are about the lives of your constituents. So you're going to be far more gung ho in your attitude in terms of of getting things opened again. And it comes back to what I said before. Those who locked down earlier and fastest, those that got the virus under control, the countries that did this actually had far less of an economic impact. So it's, it's utter madness to once again be driven by econ um, economics when we're talking about recovery from this. I'm, I fear we will be, if for no other reason that I can't see the government um, continuing for very much longer in mitigating the worst economic impact. So obviously the UK budget is due, I think, March the 6th. Um, have you had any, any idea or any sense, Carol, of where the Chancellor's planning to go with continuing support for people furloughed or people who are self-employed? Uh, no, and it's it's quite worrying because if you remember, it took us right up to the wire in, in October before the Chancellor um, announced that he was going to be extending the furlough scheme at that point. So um, I can see something similar happening this time. And you've got to remember there's a pile of people who haven't received a penny of support anyway, if a lot of freelancers and if you were newly self self-employed, you haven't received any support at all from the Chancellor. So I don't think this is a Chancellor that's going to be keen to extend extend support any longer than he can get away with. And one of the other things that we do have at the moment is a £20 a week uplift in universal credit, which has been an absolute lifeline to some people that are living in, in the most disadvantaged situations. Um, so we've been pushing hard to, for this to be maintained, and we aren't getting much, um, much positive feedback on that at the moment. So we really hope that the Chancellor does do the right thing and keep that in place and does extend furlough um, in, until we're actually we're actually able to get back on our feet economically. Yeah, and the report this week that the economy has taken the biggest downturn since the time of Queen Anne being on the throne, I think 1709. Now, those kind of figures are pretty scary, but that's the sort of thing that is driving the government to think more about economics than public health. 
Um, so that kind of report isn't particularly helpful. Just before we move on to something else, um, uh, I just want to come back, um, Mirella, to the, the, the very beginning of the virus. So before the virus hit, the World Health Organization were warning that something like this virus was inevitable. So first of all, how do they know? Is that just something that happens periodically? And how seriously should governments have taken that warning? How, how common is a warning like that by the World Health Organization? I guess this is a, a difficult question because, you know, we do live in a globalized economy. So, you know, just before the pandemic, I just came back from China from a conference where I spent four days in a conference room in a room um, sitting together with 200 individuals rather than sitting like this, having a, a conversation. I think it's it's a it's a tricky one because you have to balance, as you just said, you have to balance the economy versus what you're listening to or possible threats. Of course, they should have taken a lot more seriously. Um, but I think one thing that people are not discussing at the moment, and when we talk about reopening the economy, letting the flights back in. How about we think about what's happening to our children? What kind of, you know, um, welfare, mental health issues they're going to have, they're having at the moment by not being able to go to school, see their friends. What we should be concentrating on is perhaps not thinking about reopening the bars and getting that thing started, but thinking about our young children, getting them back into education. That's something that I would personally like to see more conversations about rather than, you know, should we reopen bars as of a April? No, we shouldn't. Yeah, I would agree that I was uh, when things did begin to reopen, it seemed bizarre to me that they were letting things like that reopen before they were addressing the issue of children into education. Um, moving on, because uh, no doubt this subject COVID will continue to be a feature of these programmes for months and months to come. Um, uh, a bit more positive news for those of us who hope that children's futures will be improved, as will, our all, as will all of ours, by independence, is that Mike Russell this week has announced that um, very shortly the new bill to uh, explain what the question will be in an independence referendum and the time scale is about to be published. So we've had three pieces of legislation over the months that kind of tell us who. So we've extended the franchise. That bill came out last year. How. Um, uh, that was a bill, that, a referendum bill that was passed last year, um, how it would be operating. And now the question is what? What will the question be? It will have to be tested by the Electoral Commission. And what will the timescales be? And hopefully it will address the issue of what happens if a Section 30 isn't granted by the UK government. Carol, do you have any opinion on what the question should be? Um, I think the question should be the same as the last time, should Scotland be an independent country? Um, I know that the Tories are trying to twist it about so that the, the answer they want will be a, a yes answer. Yeah. That should Scotland remain part of the UK? Yes, and um, hoping to cause confusion. And the fact that they're, they're trying to twist and confuse shows what a panic they're actually in and how worried they are about, about the, the polls. Um, and they're, they're literally throwing everything at us just now. Um, from the royals coming to reside to Boris Johnson's benevolent visits to everything else. I think we know we're in a, a good position. Um, we also know there's a lot of work to be done, but the question, as far as I'm concerned, should be exactly the same as the last time. Should Scotland be an independent country? Yeah, and I, I think because the, the referendum is a referendum to suggest change, I think it's unlikely that the, the Electoral Commission would go for a question that is about keeping the status quo. So I, like you, I, I'm hoping that it is the same because it would be 
an awful nuisance for a lot of us who've got our yes badges and posters and flags to have to go and buy a whole lot of new ones. Um, I, also, I, also think, I also think the question, you know, the yes movement, yes is a very positive word and it's about it's about a positive new future and what we, we hope for Scotland. It's all about, it's about this ambition that we have and to have to have no associated with that just doesn't work. It's it's a positive, it's a yes, it's it's got to be it's got to yes, be the same. I, I think so, and I think that case will be very strongly made. I can remember quite a lot of no voters that I knew being kind of unhappy with the no, which is why it turned into a no thank you. I was trying to make it a bit softer. No thank you. Well, maybe we should say yes please. Um the <laughs> final story that I want to turn to um briefly is the rather interesting news that has just come out. Um, Ofcom, which is the uh, watchdog for uh, Britain's national, is Britain's national broadcasting regulator, and therefore one would assume has to be um, independent and has to be clear of influence, has just announced that a senior journalist who has a leading role with Rupert Murdoch's Times Group has been given a key voice in deciding who the new chair of Ofcom, Ofcom will be. It's been suggested for a while that the British government would like Paul De uh, Dacre, who is uh, the former editor of the Daily Mail, to be the chair of Ofcom. And he is very sceptical about um, a regulated media and would be probably a disaster for the BBC and, Let's face it, BBC doesn't often need help at being a, a disaster. So um, I, I'm just wondering, Carol, what's, uh, what, what's your take on this? Should this be allowed? Can anything be done to stop it? How on earth can someone in Rupert Murdoch's pocket be seen to be an independent voice nominating for a position on this body? I think the answer to that is he can't be. Um, but does that mean that he won't end up in that position? I'm not sure. Um, I think it was one of one of my colleagues, Richard Thompson, called the the current Boris Johnson government a democracy, and I think that's that's a really good way of describing it. It's about who you know and about who who you can lobby. Um, but it's it is pretty worrying. I'm not I'm not surprised, but it's pretty worrying. I mean. Ofcom itself is, has said that it should it's it should um, remain an independent body, but I think we all have to question: Is that possible, knowing the characters that are involved? Well, given that Rupert Murdoch has a vested interest in what happens to British broadcasting media because he has so many fingers and so many pies, that seems kind of particularly strange. Muriel, how, um, Mirella, how important do you think it is that we have a truly independent broadcasting watchdog? I, it, it's utmost priority. I mean, it's a no-brainer. Conflict of interest just cannot be there. So um, I would say if enough voices are raised against this, it's not going to happen. Um, I think we live in a country where we can raise our voices and where we can be listened to. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with, with the ridiculous media, like listening to Fox News, etc. It just it should not be happening. Well, of course, that is there, there is dereg further deregulation coming in the UK, and we are expecting a Fox News type channel, maybe more than one, to appear. It's interesting that um, a call, according to... Uh, the regulator strategy, it has to ensure that Ofcom has regard to the Secretary of State's wider strategic policies. So even at that, it doesn't seem to be particularly independent if it has to keep an eye on what um, the Secretary of State has in terms of broadcasting. And we know that the Tory government are very anti the BBC. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? The right think that the BBC is left and the left think that the BBC is right. And um, uh, in Scotland, um, independent supporters know or think that the BBC is a tool of the unionists. So <laughs> it doesn't seem that the BBC can win. What could the BBC do to win back public confidence, Carol? I think one, one of the things that I find frustrating about the BBC is this 
uh, need to, to project balance. So when we're talking about vaccines, we get um, a health professional talking about vaccines and then we get somebody that knows absolutely nothing about it telling you why they don't want to, to have it. Um, that's not balance. That's that's just stupidity. That's that's daft broadcasting. Um, I think the BBC need to be more aware of telling the truth rather than ensuring balance because balance doesn't always reflect what the truth is. And I'll give you an, another example. During the 2014 referendum, you'll know they always had a yes voter and a no voter to ensure that there was balance. But but we know that there were cases where they had to search to find a no voter in order to, to provide that balance. Um, so the, the, report what is happening. Don't report what you think you need to in order to 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 appear as though you have no no um, ball in the game, as it were. I suppose that whole idea of balance is so imbued in the BBC Charter that it will be a long time before they take, which I think is absolutely right. Report the truth, not necessarily the balance. Obviously, Broadcasting Scotland is an independent broadcasting outlet. And what distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from, say, a website or a blog, apart from our brilliant programmes, obviously, are the costs that we face to enable us to produce TV programmes. These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. And we have a big year coming up. We have an election to cover in May and we may have the run-up to an independence referendum. In the last year, some of our financial supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In some way, we'd prefer it if it was because they didn't like us rather than they found the financial pressures which we're all under because of COVID. So, once again, we're asking you to support Broadcasting Scotland. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser, which is going reasonably well, is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use our donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. At the moment, everyone who appears on Broadcasting Scotland who works behind the scenes are volunteers. If you want us to be Scotland's truly independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. The website is up on the screen just now www.broadcastingscotland.scot forward slash donate. Just imagine what we could do if we had only 1% of BBC Scotland's channel budget. So please consider making your imagination a reality. Please support us if you can afford it. I'd like to thank my guests today. That's been a fantastic programme with two superwomen on. Um, and please join us again next week. I'll be back hosting the programme for another look at the week that we've just had and a potential look to the future. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the, the Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians in the, the Basque. Just looking at the, the overall share uh, numbers for Scotland at the moment, the SNP 46.4%.